In our Ash Wednesday service this past week, we prayed a prayer of confession. And the closing confession was, we confess our negligence in prayer and worship and our failure to commend the faith that is in us. And that confession is based on 1 Peter 3, where Peter writes, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. We don't worship him as some great teacher. We don't worship him as the guy who makes us feel good. We worship him as Lord of our life. And if someone asks about your hope as a believer, says Peter, always, always be ready to explain it. So for Lent, we as a church are following the theme, Rethink Your Life. And that's the gift of Lent. It comes to give us an opportunity to reflect on our lives and particularly on our walk with God. But what does it mean? What, what might it mean for us to rethink our lives? I mean, if we rethink our lives, what, what are we being asked exactly to rethink? If I rethink my life in terms of my health, for example, I would have to consider my diet and exercise and stuff like that. If I rethink my life in terms of my marriage, I'd have to consider my priorities, my time management, my emotional availability, and so on. As followers of Jesus, Jesus gives us a simple, powerful measuring stick, which helps us to rethink our lives in all aspects. Listen to the measuring stick of Jesus. He said, you did not choose me, but I chose you. It's so important. You did not choose me, but I chose you. Even when we think that we chose to follow Jesus like that old hymn, I have decided to follow Jesus. It's really not our decision. Jesus chose us first. Our choosing is just a response to his choosing. And so we have been chosen, and not just chosen, but we're chosen with a purpose. Jesus goes on and says, and I appointed you to go and bear fruit. So we are chosen and we are appointed. We have We have a purpose, we have a task to do, and not just fruit, but fruit that will last, which is kind of code for saying you are to bear fruit that has eternal consequences. You did not choose me, I chose you, and I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. So for Jesus, the measuring stick for our lives is fruitfulness. If we are going to rethink our lives, the framework, the background, the context that Jesus invites us to look at our lives is to ask ourselves a question of fruitfulness. Are our lives fruitful? I was wondering, and maybe maybe it's just me, but I was wondering, again, with all we've been through, and maybe not just because of COVID, but with all it is, I was wondering if we had lost sight of Jesus' claim on our lives, that word claim. I wonder if we'd lost sight of Jesus' claim on our lives. This this quite radical thing of, you did not choose me, I chose you and I appointed you to go and bear fruit. I I wonder how many of us might have forgotten that that's the claim that is on our lives. I wondered in my thinkings, I wondered if we were still filled with a passion with a determination for the gospel, a real desire to commend the faith that is in us. Or I wondered if perhaps we had just kind of fallen into a rut of going through the motions, of doing only what really needs to be done, of doing only what suits us when it suits us. Or whether there might still be fire in our bellies, I wondered, I wonder if there's fire in our bellies, if there's a sense of being appointed by God to do something in particular. You know, all through history, and no matter what it is, right up until today, a disciple is someone who is mesmerized by the master, by the teacher. And they will do whatever it takes to become like their master, to master the skills of the teacher. But it begins with a form of being mesmerized. This is someone I admire. This is someone I want to be like. That movie, that old movie, Karate Kid, from from decades ago now, is really a story, if you know it. It's a story of discipleship. It's a story of a young man who chooses to learn the ways of his master teacher. And he doesn't always understand why the master wants him to do what he does. He often resists the discipline Uh, that the master puts him through. But in the end, it's his desire to become the karate champion that kind of keeps him in the game, that keeps him going at it. And to be a disciple of Jesus 
is to be so mesmerized by him that we will do whatever it takes to be like him. That we, we believe so deeply in the cause of Jesus, in a life of fruitfulness, that we will do whatever it takes to be like him. And then Peter's words make sense. We will worship him as Lord of our life, as the one who has a claim on our lives. And when we look at Jesus, when we look at this master teacher, what he teaches us in all of his life, what he teaches us is fruitfulness. Everything about the life of Jesus was about bearing the fruit of God's life. The miracles he performed, the parables, the sermons, the conversations, even his confrontations with people, they were all the fruit of someone deeply immersed in God's life. And so the life of Jesus is the perfect example when we talk about fruitfulness, of what fruitfulness looks like. Because through the life of Jesus, people are helped and healed and changed. The dead come to life, both literally and metaphorically. The lost are found, the lonely are welcomed, the hungry are fed, the thirsty are quenched, the mundane find new purpose. The sinner is saved, the violent are forgiven, the bereaved find family, the fearful find faith, the religious find God, and the weak find strength. It's quite remarkable that all of this stuff happens through one life in just the space of three years. And when we talk about fruitfulness and we look at the life of Jesus as the example, to be fruitful really means to manifest, to bring into the present the life of God in the world. To be fruitful is to to make manifest, to bring the life, to pour the life of God into the world. Whenever we express God's life, whether it's feeding a hungry person or a kind word, we are manifest in the goodness of God. It's fruitfulness. And I wonder if we've forgotten that in many ways, if you read the Gospel, particularly the Gospel of John, in many ways it seems like that's almost all that Jesus cared about, that we would do, that we would become. I was in Johannesburg this past weekend and I got to spend some time with Jakob Gerber, who is a son of our church and uh, is now in ministry. And he took me to see one of the churches which he serves. And as we stood in the building, he said something like this. These aren't his exact words. But he said to me something like, when we gather on a Sunday, you can see the fruit. And what he was really saying is he was saying the kingdom of God is here when we meet. And I want to tell you, even though the building was empty, I could feel the joy. I could feel the joy it brought in him. But I felt I could feel the joy in the room. The kingdom of God is here. Fruit does that. There's nothing There's nothing like the fruit of the kingdom. And so today we hear the call of God. You did not choose me, but I chose you. We are chosen and I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. That's the call on your life and the call on mine. And it doesn't matter what it is you're doing, whether you're inventing vaccines, working the tills at a grocery store, if you're in a retirement home, if you're balancing books for someone, if you're raising children, when you're serving in the church, it doesn't matter what you're doing. The burning question is for all of us, the measuring stick, the framework is, is my life fruitful? And particularly, is my life Jesus fruitful? Is it bearing the fruit that will last, that will bear witness to the kingdom that has kingdom values, is my life fruitful? In the Sermon on the Mount, uh, Jesus says something that I find quite unsettling. Uh, Anyone anyone who recognizes their imperfections should find it unsettling, I think. Jesus says, beware of false prophets who come disguised as harmless sheep, but are really vicious wolves. You can identify them by their fruit, that is, by the way they act. Can you pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? A good tree produces good fruit and a bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree can't produce bad fruit and a bad tree can't produce good fruit. So every tree that does not produce good fruit is chopped down and thrown into the fire. Yes, just as you can identify a tree by its fruit, so you can identify people by their actions. It's quite a challenge. It's quite a challenge. And Jesus' type fruitfulness, that change to becoming a good tree, 
doesn't just happen. That's a lie to believe it just will occur. It doesn't just happen. It requires some action, some commitment on our part to transform. And the good news is, it really is good news, the good news is how that happens is not a guessing game. There are a number of things that we can do which Jesus has already taught us and has taught us over all these years we've been reading the scriptures. That There are things that we can do that Jesus has taught us. And even more than that, not just that Jesus has taught us, but things that have been proven over the centuries. The things that Jesus taught, people have tried and they've been found to be true. And they do make human lives more fruitful. There are things that we can do that have the power to transform the kind of person we are becoming to help us become more and more fruitful. So I hope today's sermon is really an invitation for the rest of Lent. I hope you'll join us all the way through Lent and into our Easter weekend so that together we can rethink our lives. And in so doing, we can learn to worship Jesus, not as the great guru, not as the guy who makes us feel good, but we can worship Jesus as Lord of our lives. Thanks for joining us. See you in the weeks to come.